Hey everyone, Julia Usher from Recipes for a Sweet Life. I'm back this week with another dimensional cookie. It's not three-dimensional in my classic dimensional sense, but rather it lays flat and is dimensional because I've got many different layers on it, or at least a few different layers on it. I'm speaking of my still life cookie that you see here using the fondant applique technique. It uses the same technique that I used in a recent baby shower cookie video. The only difference here is that rather than stamping the background as I did in the baby video, I'm gonna be airbrushing and stenciling it to create a very different look. The other great thing is I'm gonna be showing you how to create a custom look to that background stencil by combining two different stencils of your choice to create something that's unique and different. Stencils don't have to be cookie cutter, they can be combined in an infinite number of ways. So let's talk about what you'll need for this particular project. So first off, you'll need at least one iced cookie. I prefer to start with white because we're going to be layering colors on top of it. It needs to be dry all the way through ideally because we'll be stenciling on it and applying a little bit of pressure. You might want a couple or more if you're serving a lot of people, but at least a couple in case you make a mistake on the one. You'll need stencils, of course. We're going to be working with stencils from my Julia stencil line to create a combo background using two different stencils. But I should say, before I show you how to do that, I do have a number of duo type background stencils in my Prettier Plax line that already combine two patterns. So if you have one of those that you like, like this one from my I'm Yours set, then by all means go ahead and use it. But this background pattern is a little too big, large scale, for the size of stuff I'm putting behind my still life. So I wanted to go with a smaller scale pattern, which requires me to combine a couple of other stencils. These are also from my Prettier Plax line from two different sets. This is from my Save the Date set, and I believe this is from my single monogram set. But I'll have the links to all of these stencils and all of the sources in my video description. So I'll be combining these two. This will be the background, the wallpaper pattern, and this will be effectively the tablecloth pattern, the one on the bottom. To airbrush and stencil, you of course need an airbrush. I've got a new Julia airbrush system, the link to which is also in the video description. It's a dual action airbrush, and I'll be using that. It affords great precision and control, particularly with these very detailed stencils. To hold the stencils in place, it's useful to have a stencil genie by Creative Cookier, or a stencil frame, it's a magnetized frame and some additional weights. Sometimes I use these to weight down the frame even more, and I use these elements to weight down stencil pieces. These are small magnets. Now for the appliques that go on top of the background to create that dimensional effect I talked about, we're gonna be stamping on rolled fondant. So of course you need a little bit of white fondant. You need an assortment of stamps, and I've got a vase, which is gonna be the primary element in my still life, and a bunch of other little smaller elements, possibly other potted plants, or an assortment of butterflies. To stamp on it, I use the same food coloring I use to mix up colored royal icing, a liquid gel food coloring, either AmeriColor or Chefmaster. And I'll be applying that to what was once an uninked stamp pad that had nothing on it prior to me putting food coloring on it. This has been used with brown before, so it shows brown, but originally it had nothing on it. We'll want to get some color on some of those appliques, just a touch. So we're going to be working with compressed petal dust that allow for great control and just a real soft, subtle effect of color. And to apply them, you need a pretty short bristled, hard, stiff brush to dig out the powder. And of course, to roll the fondant for the appliques, you need a pasta machine. You don't need a pasta machine. You could theoretically use a rolling pin, but I'm going to be rolling this very, very thin and I get a much more uniform and very thin roll of fondant with a pasta machine. And I like a thin roll of fondant because big chunks of fondant to me are just a little bit too sweet on cookies. So that's what you'll need. We're gonna start with how to design this cookie and plan it. So with a cookie that's as composed as this with so many different elements and also one that employs these two techniques, both stamping and airbrushing, I like to test things out on paper first, and I often advise that you do that. The reason I'm testing it out on paper is because it gives me an opportunity to test airbrush colorings before they hit the cookies. I do want a relatively light background so that the foreground elements pop off. So I did want to test my brown food coloring. Here I used a mixture of brown and white food coloring. I already toned down the food coloring and it still was a bit dark to me, so I added a bit more white, and I've ended up with this shade over here, which I think is gonna be much more agreeable with the darker fondant elements on top. They won't compete quite as much. 
And I've actually traced the cookie cutter I use so I can really frame out the cookie and get a good sense of what it's going to look like. So that being said, this is not the coloring I'm going to use. I think this is going to be it. The other element I like to test out are my stamps typically. Not all stamps are created equal and by that I mean they don't all take to food coloring equally well and stamp as cleanly or precisely. Those that are clear adhesive mount stamps, I don't have any of those up here, tend to repel food coloring and don't often work well. Sometimes they do, so they most definitely need to be tested on paper with food coloring. Typically these wood mounted stamps that have sort of natural rubber stamp matter on it tend to work pretty well, but in all cases it's good to test them out, get a feeling for how you have to apply pressure to get an even imprint and so on. So I did that for a number of the foreground elements that I might use, and I went ahead and cut them out much the way we'll cut out the fondant to go on top. And this gives me also an opportunity to arrange them as they might go on the cookie in advance. So I know precisely what I'm going to use before I start, how many pieces I need, and I don't make a lot of extra. So something like this could be super cute with the flowers off to one side and the butterflies kind of dancing up one side. So I think that's probably where I'm going to be headed. It's a slightly different variation than what I did up front, but I think it's going to be equally cute. We'll see. So let's talk first about how to airbrush and stencil the background. Okay, we're ready to create our custom stencil background using two stencils. I'm going to start with this dot pattern that's going to be laid on the top of the cookie. However, we don't want it showing dots down here. So I'm going to take my quadrant masking tool. It's a blocking tool that is sold on the Confection Couture site and block out the lower half of the stencil. I'm actually going to insert it into the frame so it stays relatively put right where I want it. It's going to overhang the frame, but that's okay. I think right about here is going to be fine, but we'll see. So you want to put the blocker on top because if you put it underneath the pattern stencil, it'll lift that pattern stencil away from the cookie and you're more likely to get under spray airbrush coloring going under the stencil in a blurry fuzzy pattern and we don't want that. So typically I always block on top, put masking pieces on top. And I want that about centered like so. I want to make sure the dots are kind of centered on the cookie too. So I think they'll be centered here in that little notch at the top of the cookie quite well. And also through the mid zone. Now sometimes I weight down the edges of the genie if it's not lying flat. There's a little low spot in the middle of the cookie so as I come through and stencil the dots in here I'm going to be pressing down with my trussing needle as I move my airbrush around to make sure that's really truly laying flat. Now let's talk about food coloring a bit. I want a light brown, a custom blend, so I like to mix that separately, particularly if I'm going to be using it in large quantities and I have to repeat the color. To do that, I've used Chef Master Harvest Brown in conjunction with an alcohol-based white food coloring. I find that white food colorings, namely Americolor and Chef Master, that are water-based, those two are, tend to be really wet and they leave more spotting on the cookie. Whereas if I mix their colors with this alcohol-based white, it just tends to dry a lot faster because of the alcohol and the white. I have noticed with some colors some interaction effect between the alcohol-based white and the normal water-based coloring. Sometimes they can actually coagulate and become really thick and not pass through the airbrush. It tends to happen with my black colors or maybe with some of the Americolor blacks. I haven't quite isolated the problem area but it seems to work fine with my Chef Master Harvest Brown which, which we have in here. It's still very fluid. It should be the consistency of water or very thin milk. So I've got it mixed, I think, to my satisfaction. I'm just going to give it a test on the paper towel, and then we're going to go ahead and airbrush. The first step with my airbrush is to make sure the airflow regulator is turned about one quarter of a rotation. This ensures relatively low flow from the compressor, and I only pull back minimally on the trigger because I don't want an over accumulation of coloring on top of the stencil. I'll be working at a 90 degree angle and very close range, about one to two inches away. I think I'm only going to go over it once because I want it to be pretty light. So there may be, if you only go over it once, sometimes there can be more unevenness in the color just because sometimes you might be hitting an area harder than another. So despite the genie, my stencil is still lifted in some areas, which is why I'm holding it down with a trussing needle so it lies completely flat and so I get no underspray. Looks nice. It's a little dark here, but that's okay. Now to create the dividing line between the two patterns, I'm simply taking two quadrant masking tools and sliding them next to each other to form a line, and then snapping them into place in the stencil genie. 
Now they're still lifting here in the center, so I do want to weight them down further. Again, the flatter the stencil sits against the cookie, the less likely you are to spray under it. I'm also using my trussing needle to additionally weight it down. So I have a little irregularity here. I got a lot more coloring there than here, but that's going to be okay because I'm going to be laying stuff on top of that intersection point, and it's going to look a little more vintage that way. So let's see what that looks like. I'm a little concerned I might have gotten under spray here because the stencil was lifting. So it is a little more hazy here than over here where I had the stencil lying flatter. But again, we're going to be covering a lot of that, so I think that's acceptable. And now I want to lay the lower half. We're just going to kind of do the mirror image of what I did before. We're going to lay the pattern in the bottom half of the genie and the mask on the top half. I'm trying to set this so that the tops of these little diamonds intersect with the brown lines. I'm trying to overlap them a little bit. And then again, you want to center your pattern in the cookie. And I'm going to lay a few magnets here to keep it from opening up again because it is lifting and th this is really closely overlapped. So the airbrushing technique for the second half of the design is exactly the same. This is detail work, so I'm holding the airbrush about one to two inches away with low flow on the air regulator and limited pullback on the airbrush trigger. I'm also spraying stripes, so I like to spray along the length of the stripe as opposed to crosswise. That just ensures less underspray. And again, if the stencil is lifting anywhere, do hold it down with a trussing needle. That's another safeguard against underspray. So let's see what it looks like. Ta-da, looks nice and clean. Now, I also want to shade around the edges to kind of frame out the cookie, just give a light shadow of color here. And for that, I'm using a different technique slightly. I'm much further away from the cookie, about five to six inches away. And again, my airflow is low and my pullback on the trigger is limited because I just want a shadow of color. So I think that looks pretty good. There's a little bit of variation where I went over it more heavily in some spots than others, but that's going to give it a vintage finish. We're going to go on to cut out the fondant appliques, give them a little bit of drying time, and then we're going to dust this piece in the appliques. So with the background all set, we're ready to work on the foreground elements, the fondant appliques. To do that, and I've done this before, so I'll go pretty quickly. Just take a little bit of white fondant, get it started out. I do like to work on my pasta machine because I get a nice uniform, even roll. I will start it on the number one setting. Need my glasses for this which is the most open, and then advance gradually to number four, which will be less than a sixteenth of an inch thick. That's already getting kind of large for what I need to stamp, so I'm going to cut it in half. And then take it down to three. I can probably skip to take it down to three and then roll it out on four, which is the finest I want to go for this particular application. If you find you're getting a rough roll or anything, any other colors in the fondant, it's because the roller blades are dirty. This is a little bit rough, but I think we can work with it. And so here's the thickness we're going for. So we're ready to stamp. I'm just applying brown liquid gel food coloring, what I usually use to tint my royal icing to an uninked foam pad. It had no prior coloring on it. And stamping as you would stamp on paper, but directly on the fondant. At this point, I just want to roughly trim around these pieces. Then I'm going to let them dry overnight so as to allow the coloring to fully set and also to allow the fondant to firm up a bit. It'll be much easier to trim if it's got a little firmness to it. Now for this bigger piece, it's a little more challenging to ink. I like to do it upside down so I can make sure I've got really good coverage. And I want to make sure also that I'm applying pressure to every element on that stamp because it is so big, I'm going to be doing that extra carefully here, and that looks great. Again, just a rough cut here. We'll trim it out more fully later. Every fondant dries at a different rate. I'm using satin ice, and this dries just where I want it overnight. So it's rigid but still cuttable. So we're ready to trim out the fondant pieces. I want to get them really tightly cut around the pattern so they look more like isolated elements and not something random stuck on the cookie. So we're going to be headed, for instance, with the butterfly towards something like this. Now the piece that I just stamped is way too floppy for me to handle, and chances are I'm going to smudge the pattern as I do try to cut around it. So typically I like the fondant to dry at least a few hours, if not overnight. So you can still get through it with your fingers like so but it's not flopping around on me, and this part's probably a little bit more dry. Now by contrast, I think this piece was stamped 
a week or so ago, and so it's quite hard to get through. It cracks, and you run the risk of just cracking through most of the pattern, and it's going to be much harder to get into all these little areas if it doesn't have some degree of softness. So this one's dried too long. So let me go ahead and trim out this easy one that's dried the right amount of time. So now we're ready to trim, and I usually start with scissors and just do some broad cuts to frame out the piece. Then I move in with my next smallest tool, which is the tip of my paring knife, and get even closer to the pattern. You want to cut gradually because there is some risk of chipping or cracking the fondant piece if you cut too much too fast. Now, again, chipping away with the tip of my paring knife in between the antennae until I get relatively close. And I'm going to do some broad cuts here just to cut very, very, very close to them. And that looks good. My third smallest tool is my trussing needle tip, and I like to use that to get into tiny places like here around the base. I also used it between the wings a little bit earlier. But be careful, even with a small tool, not to break off delicate pieces. I'm kind of pushing the base of the butterfly back in because it's beginning to crack. The big pieces, the vase, will be done exactly the same way. Again, just broad cuts, but be careful so as not to crack the fondant by cutting too aggressively. Once we get it basically cut down, I'll turn to my paring knife and cut even closer to the pattern. Here I'm just kind of chipping away, if you will, at the fondant with the tip of my paring knife. That's sometimes the safest cutting action to avoid cracks. And then to get in around those fine details, I'll take the tip of my trussing needle. Just be careful even at this point about handling the piece too much from the top because even the heat of your hand can smudge the food coloring even though the piece is dried. And then so on and so forth all the way around until you end up with something like this. Now I'm going to clean up and we're going to be adding some color not only to these appliques but also to the background using a dusting, a dry on dry technique where dry petal dusts are applied with a dry paintbrush. So let's get some color on these appliques, shall we? The idea is uh, just a soft hue, however. I want this to be kind of vintage and just kind of a not in your face kind of effect. And so for that reason I'm using compressed petal dust. They're quite compact. So even with a little digging it's hard to get a lot on your brush. It's hard to over apply it. Whereas with an uncompressed dust, a little bit more on the cookie. And I certainly don't want to paint the dust on. That is extend it with alcohol because then it can be really opaque and much much darker than I like it to be. However to work with these compressed dust you need pretty rigid brushes that you don't mind messing up, that are stiff enough to dig out some of the color. I like to have one that I'm going to reserve for dark colors and another one for colors like green, yellow, etc. I'm just going to start by trying to dust this guy just as I dusted that one. I'm using Petal Crafts Compressed Dust and I'll have sources in the video description. Now to get color on these little butterflies I'm going to use a dry on dry technique which means I'm using a dry brush on dry fondant with dry petal dusts. I'm using a relatively stiff small brush because I need to dig out that compressed petal dust to get enough dust on the brush itself to impart color on the fondant. So again here I am kind of digging it out just by scrubbing the brush around and then scrubbing or rubbing it into the fondant itself. Moving on to orange, I'm going to hit these two areas and then I want to swap out brushes Actually, I want to sweep off the excess dust first, swap out brushes to my brush that I use for darker colors, and apply some blue here on the wings of the butterfly. And that looks just great. Now I'd continue and do that for all the pieces I want to put on it. For instance, if I'm going to use this succulent, I might do something like that. Typically I like to draw on colors I've used elsewhere, so I've got the same purples and greens here as here. And also for the flower vase, I've picked up a little bit of the same yellow and orange in the primary flowers and the same blue at the bottom of the vase. I think I'm probably going to use these elements. I do, however, want to dust some parts of the background as well. Now here I'm dusting on royal icing. This is the stenciled cookie we did before. So royal icing is a different medium. It's a little more slick than fondant, so you might find you have to rub harder to get equal color, or it just might not take to the same degree. It might be a little bit lighter, but that's okay for what we're doing here. I want a lighter background so my darker elements really pop. I'm going to pick up the same, some of the same colors as used in the elements I just brushed. A blue and the yellow are going to fill in every other diamond here. So let me get dusting here. 
and you'll see it goes down a little less solidly than it did on the fondant, but I kind of like that look. I'm going to alternate every diamond with it. You want your airbrush coloring to be completely dry. It usually dries very, very fast, but if it looks at all wet, you don't want to be doing this. So by the nature of this technique, it's an imprecise process. If I rub a little bit harder or have a little more coloring, I might have a darker spot. So, and again, this is kind of a vintage effect, so that's nice, but I'm going to try to even it out. If I have something really, really light, I'm going to add a little bit more here so that looks a little darker. Okay, so now we're ready to go back to our light brush and pick up this yellow and every other diamond. Looks like I have a little orange mixed in there, so it's not a pure yellow, either on the brush or on the pad itself, but I think that's going to be okay. Now before I put any fondant pieces down, I want to put a border down because they might interfere with getting that border down later. I'm just doing beadwork using icing of beadwork consistency, and I'll have all the consistency adjustments in a link in the video description. I like that brown dot work because it ties into the brown used in the stamps on top. Now I'm ready to arrange the rest of the stamp pieces on top. Again, nothing is stuck down at this point because I just want to make sure I've got the arrangement as I want it before I glue anything with icing into place. I'm not sure about that big butterfly. It looks a little heavy, so maybe I'll just use this little guy down here instead and leave that big butterfly for another cookie. So I think I've got it where I want it, so I'm just going to stick these down with some thick royal icing glue. The thicker the icing is, the faster it dries, and again I'll have consistency adjustments and a link to my royal icing recipe in the video description. Now for this little pot of succulents, I do want to give it a little more lift, so I'm sticking a little blob of fondant on top of the royal icing and then more icing on top and I'm going to stick this on top of all of that and that will just sit a little bit higher than the other vase and just add more interest to the cookie. I'm going to perch this little butterfly on the edge of the cookie. I think having things hanging off also adds a little element of surprise. But these remaining two butterflies I do want to give more lift to. So again I'm putting down a little blob of fondant and affixing it to the cookie with royal icing and then to the fondant piece with a little bit more royal icing. And we'll do the same thing with this guy at the top. The fondant allows me to press these in and, and have them oriented at different angles as well. And there she is, so pretty, just lovely for any occasion, Mother's Day, birthday, garden party, you name it. Of course you needn't be limited to airbrushing and stenciling the background, particularly if you haven't made the investment in an airbrush. You could instead use the stencils with royal icing, spread the royal icing over them. You could sponge coloring through them, or you could dispense with the stencils altogether and stamp the backgrounds as I did in a recent baby shower cookie video that uses the same fondant applique technique. If you haven't seen that video, I encourage you to jump on over to it. In the meantime, live sweetly.